Hello everyone and welcome to our latest webinar. Um, fresh from having Brexit and um, Donald Trump winning the election in America, we've now got another fantastic exclusive for you, which is the Sony FS7 Mark II. Thanks for joining us. My name is Rob Newton. I'm the host for this session. Um, and, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Alistair Chapman. I'm sure you've heard before. Um, who is an experienced DOP certified trainer for Sony. So hello, Alistair. How are you doing? Yeah, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yep, I was lucky enough to have attended a seminar on this camera and played with it. So I've got lots to tell you and lots to discuss. Excellent. As always, um, if people don't know, Alistair's got 25 years of experience working in the broadcast industry. Uh, and he runs workshops and training sessions like this one. So it's great to have him here. And as he said, one of the few people to actually have got his hands on the actual camera and um, went to the press conference, etc. So if anyone knows anything about it, it's Alistair. So great to have him here. Um, before we get started, just um, some uh, housekeeping, really. Um, on your screens, you'll see there's a question box. Please use it. It makes the presentation engaging. It also means that you get answers to the questions that you've got. If you don't use it, then you won't get the answers. So please ask plenty of questions throughout the webinar. Don't wait till the end. We're also recording this webinar. So if you want to listen to it later on, or if you've got friends, colleagues who also want to see it, then we will be sending you a link probably tomorrow once we've um, downloaded the recording. You may not know that we also do uh, master classes and product launches in Teddington where you can actually get your hands on the kit. So if you're interested in that, please check out our website, visuals.co.uk slash events. So, yeah, so, so those are, that don't know me know me. I shoot all kinds of things, everything uh, from... I uh, started doing motor racing, motorsports for the BBC, through to kids' TV, adventure sports, and drama. Also shoot a lot of severe weather. It's kind of my speciality. So I travel around the world a lot, so having a good camera that can shoot at high quality in all kinds of conditions is really important to me. And the FS7, I own an FS7, um, is a really great camera. It can shoot in HD, it can shoot in 4K, it can do slow motion, it can do raw, it's a very powerful, very capable camera, and it's now kind of become an industry standard. You know, BBC use them, most major broadcasters, I was at CNN the other week doing some, some stuff with them, and they're using FS7, so they're, they're one of those cameras now that a producer will, you know, perhaps a producer who doesn't know anything at all about cameras might just say, we need an FS7, because they've heard that name somewhere, and it's got a good reputation. Um, it has been in the market for a while, though, and sometimes that's seen as a bad thing because everyone starts asking that question is, oh, God, when is it going to be replaced? Is it old technology? Is it out of date? But then the, other, the flip side to that is, of course, a camera has to be in the market a reasonable amount of time for people to learn about it, to understand what it can or can't do, to understand you know, its limitations and where it works well, where it doesn't work. So it, it needs that time in the market to become that industry standard. You don't become an industry standard overnight. You don't launch a camera and then the next day it's the industry standard. It does take time. It takes a year to 18 months for a camera to get that reputation of being a good, solid, reliable workhorse. So there's good things about having a camera in a market a long time. And the FS7 is what I would call a mature product. It's been in the market long enough for any of the early bugs to be ironed out and for people to understand it, to know about it, and, and it is a good camera. It does, you know, for the money, it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, camera manufacturers, <clears throat> excuse me, they like to keep us interested and to mm -hmm. keep things going. So Sony have introduced the FS7 II. Now, Sony are adamant <clears throat> that people like me that go out and talk about this camera don't call it an FS7 Mark II. It is an FS7 II. <laughs> or an FS7 M2, because the FS7 II does not replace the FS7. And that's perhaps one of the most important things to, to really understand is this is not a replacement in any way, shape, or form for the FS7. It is a variation of the FS7 that addresses some issues on the original model, perhaps, and introduces some more to higher end features perhaps. I, I in many respects I wish Sony had called it an FS7 Plus or something like that because plus indicates it being a 
plus version as opposed to a replacement version. I think FS7 II is a little bit dangerous because I think a lot of people sort of look at that name and think, oh God, it's replacing the FS7. It's not. It's, it sits alongside the FS7 in Sony's <clears throat> rather now quite large lineup of large cinema cameras. And it's something they've been producing for a while. It's not something that's yep. new really. Um, I mean, Sony have tried and tried and tried to break into the high-end cinema market with the F65 and things like that, but yeah, Sony aren't known as filmmakers. Sony are video camera yep. manufacturers, and that's what they're known for. So they have struggled a bit with the F65, although uh, Cafe Society has just come out, done by Vittorio Storaro. Yep. If you do get an opportunity to go and see that film well presented, please do, because the use of color in that film, using the 16-bit color from the F65, is really quite remarkable. It doesn't look like any of the other films that are out there right now. It's a very, very different look. That's quite nice to see people experimenting and doing stuff that's different as opposed to everything being the same, I think. Yes, yeah, it's a Woody Allen movie, isn't it? Yes, Woody Allen, um, and it was uh, the cinematographer is Vittorio Storaro, who mm -hmm. did Apocalypse Now and uh, I can't remember, one, one of the Batman movies, and uh, yeah, his, if you look at his IMDb page, it just the list of amazing <laughs> movies that he's done is incredible, it really is. Yeah, even longer than the number of cameras that Sony's got out there. Um, oh, I'm not so sure it would be longer than that. I don't think anything would be that long. Sony have more cameras than, than I have flakes of cornflakes in my cereal bowl in the morning perhaps. Anyway, so the FS7 is one of the alpha mount system. Now, huge confusion here. Alpha mount includes E-mount, so because E-mount can be adapted to A-mount, so they call it alpha mount, but I think most of us tend to know it as E-mount. Um, so it's an E-mount camera, can take an enormous range of lenses that are from Sony, but also with adapters a huge, huge range of lenses from third parties. And I think this is one of the real strengths, actually, of the FS7, is it is so easy to adapt it to other lenses. Now, I also own Sony's F5 camera, which is the slightly higher end camera, and that has a different mount, the FZ mount, um, and the camera comes with FZ and PL. And it's actually harder to adapt that camera to other lenses, although Metabones now have an adapter for that one that's made it easier. But the E-mount is still probably the easiest mount around when it comes to, to adapting to other lenses. It's a DSLR type mount, so it adapts well to other DSLR lenses. Um, and I think it's what it, it is really, it is a strength of the camera that it has that, that lens mount on there. So what are the differences? What's so good about the A7, sorry, FS7 II? Well, the first thing you'll see on the exterior of the camera is that um, Sony have addressed what is quite a big issue actually on the basic uh, FS7, which is the viewfinder mount. It really one of the weakest points on the FS7 is the round rod that mounts the viewfinder, because as soon as you loosen any of the clamps or anything, because it's round, everything sags and droops and just rotates around the round bar. And it actually makes it quite difficult to use. It's, I've seen many shots done with FS7s where all the, the horizon and all the shots is slightly out. And the reason why the horizon's out in all the cameraman's shots is because his viewfinder was drooping slightly. And it's, it's one of those odd things when your viewfinder's off angle, you tend to shoot with the horizon off angle. Um, so they've replaced the round rod with a square bar. Um, but not only have they replaced it with a square bar, they've also changed the clamps. And so now there is a separate locking tab for each direction of movement. And one of the nice things that means now is that you can actually have the one at the front, the one closest to the viewfinder, a little bit loose. And that means you can slide the viewfinder forward and backwards while you're shooting. You don't have to, and, you know, and it doesn't sag, it doesn't droop. Whereas if you try to do that with the round bar, of course, it would just all sag and droop down. Now, this, it's not a big, you know, from a uh, construction point of view, it's not a big thing on the camera. It's a few small parts changes. You can buy these parts as spares from Sony. Can, right. So it would be possible to update and retrofit this to a standard FS7 if you wanted to. Um, knowing the price of Sony spares, though, it's not going to be a cheap thing to do, um, even though it is just a few bits of plastic and a few little clamps and things. Um, but, of course, there are also um, a whole world of third-party viewfinder brackets and supports now that get around this problem and resolve this problem anyway. So 
you know, if you have an FS7, you could upgrade your existing FS7 to eliminate these problems anyway, probably for less than buying the spare parts, and certainly less than buying a Mark II. The price difference, actually, that's an important thing, between the FS7 and the FS7 II is around about £1,800 um, currently. So that seems to be the, the, the price difference. Now, the other thing that's changed um, externally that you will see is the clamp or the bracket, the way the, um, the viewfinder arm is secured. You now have a single, um, like a thumb screw on the arm, and so it's much easier to extend that arm and, and make it shorter before you had to have a screwdriver and do the screws on the back. So that's been changed. But there are other changes to that arm as well. And that, those changes, actually, what, what they've done is you can use that same screw, the one that adjusts the length, to actually attach the arm to the body of the camera in a, almost a closed position. So it's actually very, very close. You can see on the left-hand image here how close the hand grip is to the cam camera body. You can get it much closer to the camera body than you could previously. So you can almost have a F. S5 style sort of shooting mode with the hand grip right close to the camera body. Um, again, it's a small tweak to the camera, but a very worthwhile one, and it really is an improvement. It's definitely a step in the direction, in the right direction. But there are, of course, third-party um, arms and third-party brackets and clamps again. So if you wanted to improve your standard FS7, you could do that without having to go to the FS7 too. So again, it's not a deal breaker, but it is a useful update to the camera. Do you feel a lot of these updates are, are from customer feedback that they've had on the FS7 and other cameras? Yes, absolutely. I, I think these have come from feedback from users, a majority of them. You know, people, so, Sony, I know a lot of people don't think that Sony actually listen to us, us end users, but they do. They're not very good at articulating the fact that they are listening. And one of the problems is it takes a lot of time with R&D and testing. One, one thing Sony are very careful to do is to try and test anything before they do release it. Yes, stuff does slip through that shouldn't slip through. They're not perfect. Um, so, you know, okay, they're just changing a few screws here and there, but they will be tested and make sure it's strong enough and everything else like that before it's released. And obviously a camera has to be released to the market it gets used for a while, then the feedback starts coming in, Sony start hearing the feedback, and then they go to their guys in the factory and they say, hey guys, can you do this? So it does take time. You know, you're not going to you know, say, oh, I don't like the way the arm is mounted. It's not going to come out with a new arm two weeks later. It's, it does take you know, a, a lot of time, six months to a year, to, to sort of feed it through to the system to an actual product change. Um, so yes, it is a result of listening to customers it is a result of you know, going to trade shows, talking to people at trade shows. You know, very often, if you go to a trade show and you can find somebody that's, that is from Sony and talk to them, they will listen. And if you ever find a Japanese engineer, anyone from the factory, and talk to them, and you start giving them feedback, positive and negative, you'll almost certainly always, almost always see a notepad come out, and they write it all down frantically, and it does get back to the factory. It does get back to headquarters. Um, not everything is acted upon. They're a business to make money, so there's obviously, there is the business aspect to, to think about, but they do listen to us, and they do try to address these issues. They're getting much better at it, I think. Um, so um, the other thing is we have a new um, viewfinder cover that is supplied with the FS7 II. So you get the hood, um, the standard um, uh, monocular viewfinder, and that's been changed as well. That now has a hook on the top of it. With the FS7 at the moment, there's two little wire clips, one on the top and one on the bottom. They're a bit fiddly. In fact, they're a lot fiddly. Um, and you have to sort of flick them on. And actually getting the, the top one on is the worst one because you, you've got to hold the viewfinder while you fiddle around with this little wire clip to hook it on. Well, now what they've done is they've got rid of the top one and they've replaced it with a, a fixed hook on the monocular that just goes over the top of the lug on the LCD screen. And it's much easier, much faster to fix on. And then there's only the one little wire catch underneath to do up. It's a much, much better thing. But as well as the revised monocular, you also get a 
folding LCD hood that you can attach. And that's really quite neat. Um, you just push it to fold it flat, and when it's folded and closed, it protects the screen. So when you pack your camera away at the end of the shoot, it protects the screen. When you want to use it, you can just flip it up to hold it. Now, one bit of feedback that I have already fed back to Sony, though, is that the square bar, the bar that mounts the viewfinder, is too short, um, in my opinion. Um, because if you're going to use the viewfinder, the LCD screen, with this hood, it's got to be a reasonable distance from your face to be able to focus on it. And the rod is a little bit short to be able to do that at the moment. So I have sort of told them I think that rod should be a bit longer. Whether they'll change it, I don't know. Certainly in the initial units, you're not going to see any change. You can replace the square rod with a round rod. It is, you, there's a little plastic insert in the clamp, so you can take that out and put a, square, a round rod in if you want to have a longer mount. So it is backwards compatible with the old uh, way of doing things. Okay. Um, we do have a question, is how good is the FS7 viewfinder, e.g. focus-wise? I've read that it's better to have a non-Sony viewfinder. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, the Sony viewfinder is, if I remember right, 940 by, uh, 960 by 540 pixels, or it's quarter, what they call quarter HD. Um, I can focus with it if I use peaking and things like that. But you have to consider it's a small screen, so it's never going to be ideal. Um, it's not a bad viewfinder, it's usable, but you can get better. Um, I often like using my FS7 with the Zacuto Gratical or the Zacuto Eye viewfinder. The viewfinder resolution is higher, uh, but more importantly, actually, I think the optics are better, so it looks sharper. Um, and also there are more sort of focusing tools and, and things like that on, on the Gratical and you can add LUTs with the view in the Gratical viewfinder and, and do a lot more. So it does add to the versatility and the flexibility of the camera adding that, view, that third party viewfinder. So it is something that I would consider adding and doing. You can use the standard finder. You can get, you, yes, it does the job. Um, but you can improve on it with a third-party finder. But, of course, that make, does make it more expensive. You know, yes. these, these extras are more expensive. The FS7 is clearly built down to a price. I mean, it's what's around about £5,000, something like that, for the, the camera. It's still incredibly cheap yeah. when you and consider what it does. You have to remember that the, the Zacuto graphical viewfinder on its own is fifteen is £1,500. So, you know, if Sony were to upgrade the LCD... Maybe it would add another eight, nine hundred pounds onto the cost of the camera. Yeah. You know, it's a balancing act between getting a good price and something that's usable and, and, and works. Um, other sort of exterior improvements, things that you'll see, you know, quite obviously perhaps on the outside of the camera. Um, one of those is a very simple change to the compartment at the back where the cards go in that means that the cards stick out further and actually makes them much much easier to grab hold of and pull out mm -hmm. it, on the standard fs7 it is really fiddly to get those cards out it's impossible to get them out if you've got gloves on whereas now with the new design they stick out twice as far as they do on the old one and it does just mean you can get your fingers in there a bit more easily to to grab those cards to pull them out more easily and the other thing is there is now a little green light just above the on-off switch that tells you when the camera is on. And it seems like a silly little thing, but you know, one of the things with the FS7 is if you don't have the viewfinder turned on, the LCD for some reason, you can't actually tell whether the camera's on or off just by looking at it. Um, it's really, really hard. So this little green light underneath that by that switch is a really you know, useful thing to have finally we know whether the camera is actually on or off um, easily. It should really have been like that on the FS7 from, from day one. But anyway, they've addressed that. You now have 10 assignable buttons on the FS7 too. So there's a whole bunch of extra buttons on the side of the camera. Um, three more buttons uh, on the uh, side of the body. And that really does help, you know, easy quick access to different functions of the camera my only cr criticism perhaps of this is that with so many assignable buttons with 10 of them is is remembering what the hell you've assigned to each button they have textured the buttons 
So they're actually quite easy to find by touch. They feel very, very different from the status um, and the display button. They, they have a textured ribbed sort of uh, finish them. So they're quite easy to find by touch, which is nice. Um, but the, the, there's nowhere, I mean, even if, you know, one thing perhaps on some of my other cameras where I have a sign all buttons is I, I get a little label printer and actually print out little tiny labels to give me a clue as to what I've assigned to those buttons. And really there's nowhere to actually stick anything because they're, they're so, there's so much little space. So yes, very welcome to have more assignable buttons. It's, it's nice to have, but I think with 10 of them, you have a job remembering what you've assigned to all of them. And then what ends up happening is you have 10 assignable buttons, but you only use six. Yeah. So how much of an advantage you get over the standard camera, I'm not sure. It's not bad, but in reality, again, I don't think this is a deal-breaking improvement. No. Um, the big thing though, this really is what could yes. be for a lot of people the deal breaker, yeah. is the electronic variable ND filter. So if you've got an FS5, if you've used that or played with an FS5, you'll know what this is all about already. Um, basically they've taken out the mechanical filter wheel and put in the same variable ND filter system that the FS5 has. So when the filter wheel is set to clear, there is no ND filter whatsoever. It's the little motor drives the variable ND filter out of the optical path and there is no ND filtration. It's clear, goes straight through to the sensor. But when you turn the ND filter wheel to position one, two, three, or four, a motor drives the variable ND filter into position in front of the sensor and you have a variable ND filter that goes up to uh, 128 ND uh, from a quarter to 128 smoothly, variably, very easy. You can use the dial on the side of the camera just to dial in whatever ND you want, the little uh, wheel, or you can assign three presets to the filter wheel in the menu and you can use it like a fixed ND. I think in practice most people use the wheel and use it variably. And it really, I mean, it really is, I, I wish this was in my F5, and, and I think this is going to be the thing that for many people will be the deciding factor yeah. over whether they buy an FS7 or an FS7 II. Whether it's worth the price difference, that's another question, but it is a great, great thing to have. I mean, it allows you essentially to be able to dial in the depth of field that you want. So now what, what the variable ND means that you can use your lens to set your depth of field rather than exposure and then use the variable ND to fine tune the exposure so you can do it the other way around. Um, simple things actually like going from inside to outside. Now with an auto iris on a camera as you go from inside to outside, dark inside, bright outside, the auto iris, the iris, that aperture is going to close right down. You might go from you know, wide open at f2.8 to f2.8. 8 f16 stepping outside and the problem with that is that huge aperture change totally changes not the way the shot looks inside nice filmic look shallow depth of field you step outside everything's in focus and it has the tv look and it ruins the shot whereas if you do it with the nd filter you stay at 2.8 f2.8 aperture you walk outside the nd filter looks after the exposure change and the look of the shot doesn't change. It has a more, much more consistent look. Another example is outside on a cloudy day and the sun is coming and going and you're doing an interview. And if you're using auto aperture, your depth of field is changing greatly. So the background's going in and out of focus as the sun comes and goes. So the shot looks different. And if you edit that later, you might be cutting from different parts of the interview and the depth of field is changing. So different parts of the interview look totally different. Variable ND filter doesn't do that. The depth of field remains constant. And yes, there will be some contrast changes because the light's coming and going, but the shot is much more consistent because the depth of field remains consistent. Sure. So it really is a, a great, um, great thing. Mm. Um, so the minimum density available, the question that's been asked is uh, yep. it's a quarter ND is the minimum density on the variable ND. Um, so it's not zero, so it's a quarter. Um, ND and it is smooth. There's, it doesn't go in steps. It is an absolutely smooth change. So you can use it during the shot to fine tune your exposure. Yeah. Um, 
So a couple of so some of you know a couple of questions on on the ND filter range. I think I've asked, answered those. Um, is the price really justified? Seeing as really all we get is a variable ND filter. Only you can answer that really. It depends on how important you think the variable ND filter is. I mean there is another thing that I'll come on to in a minute that um, again is is quite different from the FS7 uh, two. Um, do I know of any plans for Sony to offer any FS7 trade-ins to encourage FS7 two sales? Um, no, I don't know of any plans. It doesn't mean that there wouldn't possibly be something in the future, but I haven't heard of anything. Um, and I'm not sure that, they, to be honest, I don't think they would be because I think the key thing is that the FS7 is not being replaced by this camera. So FS7 is current. Now, obviously, Sony would like to sell more cameras, so if they can sell FS7Twos, that's great. Um, so perhaps, I don't know, maybe they will do something just to get some sales. <coughs> Excuse me. So another thing that we get with this camera is a locking E-mount. I'm actually, I'll be perfectly honest with you, I'm torn about this. Um, it is a substantially stronger mount than the E-mount. The reason why I'm torn about it is currently on a standard FS7 E-mount, I can single-handedly change lens because all you have to do is with your thumb push in the lock button and then with your hand twist the lens, the lens comes off, you get your new lens, you grab it, you put it on, you turn it and there is a click when, it lock, when it's locked in place and you know that lens is on, you can let go of the lens and it's gonna stay on the camera. Simple, easy. Um, if you come from a photography background in particular, you'll be very familiar with that and you'll know how that works. It's, it's pretty foolproof, really. Now, this new locking mount is incredibly secure when the lens is on there correctly. But, and it, 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 you just have to be really careful with it. So in this picture here, if you look at it, you'll see two white dots. One that says lock with a little arrow by it and the white dot on the, on the body. So before you mount a lens on the camera, it's imperative that those two white dots are lined up like that. Then it's also imperative that, and this picture shows a lens that's about to go on, that the white dot on the lens, you see there's a white dot on the lens, is also perfectly lined up. All three white dots must be exactly lined up. And then to lock the camera, the lens on, once you've got it in the mount, you don't turn the lens, you turn the locking ring anti-clockwise, and as you turn it, there's a little latch at the top that will click into place, and it's not a very loud click, it's a little click, tiniest little click, <laughs> and once that latch has dropped down, the mount can't come undone, but you still actually have to keep turning it a little bit further beyond that point to get the lens totally well, secure solid. and solid. Now, when I played with the camera, myself and some of the other people that were playing with the camera, we did find actually that it was not all that difficult to not have those dots lined up, to put the lens into the mount and turn the locking ring only to have the lens just drop out because the lens isn't in the mount at all. The problem basically comes that if the lens white dot isn't exactly lined up with the two white dots on the body, the lens doesn't actually go into the, into the hole properly. It, kind of feels like it does. And then you close the locking ring, you turn it, and you hear that little click, which is the latch locking the locking ring, but the lens isn't actually secured to the camera. So you have to be really careful with this mount. You really need to make sure that your three dots are lined up before you close the lock, and then don't just let go of the lens, do make sure that it is actually locked into the mount. So that's the, the negative side of it. The plus side of this mount, and actually it is important, it is uh, something you need to understand, is that not only have they changed the mount, so the mount itself is different, but they've also changed the chassis of the camera. And this is a test rig that Sony have. And the reason really for changing this mount was to make the FS7 much better with heavy lenses. So this mount has, and, and the changes to the chassis of the camera have been done so that it will take and support heavy PL mount lenses. The basic E-mount relies on little springs 
behind, if you look at the, the camera, uh, an E-mount lens, you'll see there are some little tiny springs on the back of the flanges, and that's what holds the lens secure. It goes in, turn it, click, it can't fall off the mount, but if you actually grab that lens, you'll find you can move it. It'll go up and down a little bit, it'll actually twist a little bit. So if you're trying to use a follow focus, the lens can twist in the mount, just that tiny bit, so your follow focus isn't repeatable, isn't accurate. Um, if you're using a heavy lens, the lens can droop a little bit, and that upsets your back focus, the top of the image. Focus distance will be slightly different to the bottom of the image, and things like that. So then you have to start using lens supports and all of those things. So this lens mount addresses all of those issues. It prevents the lens from twisting once the lens mount is secure. So follow focuses, the lens aren't going to make the lens twist. It's also much stronger, and it's also capable of supporting a much, much heavier lens without need of an external lens support. So it's been tested to be able to take the same payloads as a PL mount. And the idea, the philosophy is if it'll go on a PL mount, it will also go on this mount without causing a problem. So are the changes making it more heavier than this? You know, it looks like it could be a lot heavier. Um, I don't think there's a substantial increase in the weight of the camera. Yes, there is a small increase in the weight of the camera. The mount is more complex, um, and you know, there, are, there is going to be a weight change in the camera because of that. Um, I, I don't know for sure. Um, it's not, not a big it's one. It didn't fit, certainly when I played with the camera, it didn't feel any heavier than any other FS7. But there are certainly changes to the chassis and to the mount to make it much, much stronger so it will take PL lenses so that people don't have to worry about using... Um, I think, yeah, if you're using a long um, DSLR-type lens, a 300mm, 400mm lens, something like that, no need for extra support. Now, even with a PL mount camera, a native PL mount camera, when you go to very big lenses, you still do need to support the lens. They're not indestructible mounts, and there are all sorts of reasons for wanting to support the lens to make sure there's no vibration and stuff like that. So when you do go to very big lenses, you are still going to want to use a lens support. But this does address perhaps the weakness of... E-mount. It's completely backwards compatible with E-mount, so any E-mount lens will go on this. You shouldn't have any problems with adapters and converters and everything that went on an E-mount previously should go on this new unimproved uh, mount. So I, th I think, again, this is, this is, you know, the two sort of big changes really are perhaps the, the variable ND filter and this updated, upgraded mount. Um, if you are run and gun and you're quickly swapping and you're using E-mount lenses, maybe actually the standard FS7 mounts the mount for you, but if you are using cinema lenses, if you are using adapters and bigger, heavier lenses, then this is probably the mount for you. Just do be careful how you use it. That would just be what I say would, would suggest. So, um, uh, oops, where's my mouse disappeared to? Just got a quick question, mm. Alice. So does the current uh, Metabons lens adapter fit the new lens mount? Yes, it will fit. So everything that, um, that fits currently will fit this new mount. Um, it's been designed so that the locking ring is far enough away from the, the, the sort of the throat that your metabones is and, and all those things should go. Okay. I, I must admit, I haven't actually tried it, but I see no reason why not. Okay. Um, I, 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 did, I just trying to think, did anybody actually try? Actually, I think we, ha we did have various lens adapters on the cameras at the launch event. So I think I probably have tried it. I just probably wasn't paying attention at the time. I should have paid more attention. Um, so uh, why does Sony Express ND as a fraction instead of the long accepted ND6, uh, et cetera? So um, actually, I, I'm not sure why Sony choose to go that route as to uh, quarter and, and 128th as opposed to ND6, ND8, et cetera. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Is the answer, and I can't. There are benefits to both. I mean, a quarter ND is obviously it's reducing the light, you know, by a quarter. So yeah. it's, it's quite easy for some people to understand, perhaps. Um, will the locking ring interfere with a PL mount adapter? No, it doesn't. Certainly, the, we did have PL adapters at the launch event, and I did try PL lenses on it, and there were no problems. And, and in fact, it felt really good because when the PL adapter was on the FS7 II body, it was rock solid. It actually felt as though the PL adapter was then the lens mount because I know when I'm using it on my PL adapters on my regular FS7, there's, there's that little bit of movement still there, yeah. and it just never quite feels rock solid, whereas on the, on the FS7 II, it felt absolutely rock solid, which was okay. really, uh, really, yeah, really good. 
Now, of course, we have also got to mention the new Sony lens, the 18 to 110 f4 lens. If you haven't tried this lens, you really should. It's very, very different actually to the 28 to 135 millimeter lens. The 28 to 135 lens is a nice lens, but it's all electronically driven. So you can turn the zoom ring and quite, you know, turn it really quickly, but you have to wait for the lens to catch up. So you turn the zoom ring and then it's like, wait, 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 and eventually the lens sort of zooms all the way in or zooms all the way out. It's, the zoom is slow because it's all done with, with motors and servos. Um, the new lens, the 18 to 110, is mechanical. There is a mechanical, physical connection between the zoom ring and the lens elements, so you can crash zoom with it. You can crash in, crash out, and the same with the focus. It's, it's very fast, it's responsive, it's quick, it's snappy, and it is, as a result, not just perhaps a more useful zoom range, because 28 to 135 is a bit long for most people on a Super 35 sensor. 18 to 110 is, a, I think, a far more usable range, that bit wider. Most people you know, shooting these cameras are tending to be using wider lenses, so it's a much more useful range, but also it's a much better constructed lens. You have that mechanical connection on the zoom, so you can crash zoom. It really is a nice... You know, better feeling lens to use, a much nicer lens to use. So I really sort of do recommend that if you haven't uh, you know, tried it, played with it, yep. do, do have a look. Um, there is a shoe for mounting it for support, but it doesn't rotate like the other lens. It's now fixed. Um, and they've also put the shutter into the lens hood, so you can open and close it. You don't have to worry about losing your lens hood. Now, we actually have had a question, um, what is my delivery format when we're shooting in 4K? So the FS7 II, like the FS7, has a 4K Super 35 millimeter, 11 million pixel, 14 stop sensor. It's a really good sensor. This sensor, <coughs> excuse me, captures a very big color range, not as big as F55, F65, those cameras, but still a very big color range. And I do shoot a lot of stuff in 4K because it gives me the ability to crop in to the image. Now, if I'm delivering in 4K to my clients, it's almost always in ProRes HQ. That tends to be the uh, most widely accepted delivery format. So if I'm doing something for National Geographic, for Discovery, for those guys, maybe um, some of my storm footage or something like that they're buying from me, it's almost always delivered as 4K ProRes. Um, sometimes they'll want it as 12-bit 444 ProRes, um, but most of the time, it's, for, it's just 10-bit 42 ProRes HQ. That tends to be the normal delivery format. I do also get requests for XAVC, um, XAVC-I, for delivery because it's a compact, it's a small file, it's easy. I can you know, often send that over the internet to people and things like that. So I get requests for that as well. But the majority of the time, it is ProRes um, HQ. Um, so um, another question, I understand that you can remote the variable ND to the hand grip thumb wheel. How responsive is the control, uh, exposure control via this method? Is there latency? Um, yes, you can. You can assign the control of the variable ND to the thumb wheel on the hand grip in the camera menu. Uh, and there is a tiny amount of latency, um, not, not a lot, um, just a little bit of latency, um, but it's it's almost unnoticeable. It's not like you're waiting for the ND to, clo to close down. There is just the tiny, tiny, minutest bit of lag. Um, really not something I've ever had a problem with. It's certainly not a, a, a big deal. It's not as instant, perhaps, as an aperture change, where you can turn it and it instantly changes. Um, there is a, just the, the smallest hesitation, for want of a better word, perhaps. But I, it's not something I would I'm concerned or, or worried about at all. The, the variable ND filter is based on um, LCD type technology. So it's like an LCD between the lens and the um, sensor that becomes brighter and darker. And, and LCD isn't instantaneous in its response. There is a just the smallest, smallest little bit of a question about the tally light. Tally light to the record button or somewhere the operator can see it. Hmm. I don't know about that. I haven't seen that, and I haven't seen it in my notes. Um, no, I'm not sure that that... I don't know. Right, um, okay. You've stumped me there. It's not right. something I've seen it. Um, 
That's Will the chassis is. of the FS7 II fit on the same ARRI hardware set as the FS7 One? Yes, absolutely. The body, the exterior body of the camera is essentially the same. That there, there's no change on the outside. It's the internal chassis of the camera that, that's been changed. So um, moving on. So something else that has been added to the camera is um, the ability to uh, record Rec 2020 as mm -hmm. your color space. So uh, when you're shooting on this slide, which is a Sony slide, actually, it's slightly um, odd, um, because actually the 2020 color space is available in custom mode. So when you shoot in custom mode, you can select as your color matrix or color space, Rec 2020. Now, if you are plugged into a 2020 monitor, you can achieve full 2020 spec out of the FS7 II by choosing 2020 color and by choosing Rec 709, ITU 709 gamma, because Rec 2020 gamma is actually the same as 709 gamma. So you can have the same 709 gamma with 2020 color, that gives you a 2020 compatible output. So when you plug the FS7 into a 2020 TV, you get the right colors. But something that's important to really understand about this, and this come, has come up before, is that the FS7 sensor, um, if you talk to Sony and say, what, what is the color range of the FS7 sensor? Sony's stock answer is it's a 709, Rec 709 color sensor. Now, it's really difficult to actually measure the color range of a sensor. And you know, many people have looked at this over the, over the last couple of years with the F5, FS7, et cetera, to try and figure out how much color it captures. And it's clear that the FS7 captures more color than 709, that the sensor can see beyond just 709. But it's not vastly bigger than 709. It's probably somewhere, if I go back to this previous slide, around the sort of P3 range, that sort of um, green triangle. So it's bigger than 709. Uh, it's kind of hidden in all those triangles, the green one. It's bigger than 709, but it's certainly not as big as S gamut 3 Cine or S gamut 3. And this is something to, un to understand is you have a recording color space, which is what is the color space I could record? And then you have the sensor color space, which is what can the sensor actually see? Now, what Sony, what's happening here is Sony adding the 2020 recording color space to the camera. The sensor can't see all of 2020. So you're not really recording anything significantly larger than in 709. You're not recording you know, colors that you haven't seen before. But what you are doing is recording those colors with the right values so that when they're shown on a 2020 display, the colors look correct. I mean, if you, as an example, if you shoot 709, with 709 color and you show it on a 2020 monitor, it looks really oversaturated and the, the hues and the tones are wrong. It doesn't look right. It's, it's not just vibrant. It, the colors aren't quite right. But by recording with 2020 color space, you're not going to see any extra colors, but the colors that you do record will look correct. The saturation will be correct. Your pictures will look right on a 2020 screen. However, though, there is actually a new standard that's only fairly recently been ratified, which is actually REC 2100. So REC 2100, and this stuff's moving so quickly now that you know, it's a real struggle to keep up with everything. REC 2100, this is the standard for HDR. And this, of course, is what everyone's talking about right now is HDR high dynamic range. The 2100 standard is for REC 2020 color, but with either a gamma curve called hybrid log gamma or a gamma curve called PQ or ST2084. The FS7, FS7 II cannot do hybrid log gamma or PQ. And actually in practice, you don't want to shoot normally with hybrid log gamma or PQ because these two standards, they kind of live side by side PQ and HLG, hybrid log gamma, um, because different TVs have different gamma curves in them, different broadcasters are using different curves, so Netflix are using um, PQ, um, BBC are likely in the future to use hybrid log gamma. And if you convert from PQ to hybrid log, log gamma or vice versa, you get a drop in image quality. They're not good at converting from one to the other. 
So in practice, if you're shooting something for HDR, for Rec 2100, you would shoot S-Log3 with S-Gamut or S-Gamut3 Cine, do your grading, and then in post-production, produce your two versions, your hybrid log gamma version and your PQ version. So having 2020 in the FS7 II, obviously it's not a bad thing, it certainly doesn't do any harm, but it has limited applications, which is really for directly feeding to a 2020 display, 2020 projector, 2020 monitor, something like that. Um, possibly in some bizarre unknown thing that I haven't quite figured out where would be yet doing a live feed in 2020. But nobody's actually broadcasting in 2020 yet. So I think having 2020, again, it's a fairly limited use application at this stage. Now, it could well be that in a future firmware update, Sony add hybrid log gamma and PQ to these cameras, because they can, they can do it, the cameras could, could do it. And then 2020 color would become more significant because then you could do direct HDR from the camera to an HDR screen for a presentation performance or whatever, and that would certainly be very interesting. But right now, the mix of 2020 with standard dynamic range has, I think, has quite limited real-world applications. applications right. So I wouldn't get too hung up about it if you don't have it. No, don't get excited. So, you know, my conclusions really on the FS7 II. Um, lens mount variable ND filter really do make it quite different from the regular FS7. The lens mount is much stronger, the chassis is stronger, and the variable ND filter is a really nice thing to have. I really do like it. And, and I, you know, my ne let's, let's put it this way. If I'm going to buy another camera in the future, I would want it to have a variable ND filter. So if I didn't have a camera right now and I was looking at FS7 and FS7 II, the FS7 II would certainly be incredibly tempting because of that variable ND filter. It's yeah. something I definitely want in my cameras. But as I own an FS7 right now, I can see no point in upgrading to the FS7 II just for that ND yeah. filter. I don't think it's a big enough advantage for me personally. Other people's opinion will obviously be different. Sure. The viewfinder mounting improvements are obviously most welcome. I wish the FS7, the original, hadn't had the round rods that it's on. But there are third-party options that you can use to upgrade a regular FS7 to that. Lots and lots of different options, and, and I think some of those third-party options are actually still better than the square rod. You know, I, I, on my FS7, I have the Vocus arm, um, and you, you, know, you can just slide the viewfinder forwards and backwards so easily on that, so I really like that one. But there are others from other manufacturers as well. So, you know, I, it, it's, I don't think it's really a selling point of the FS7 II for me because you can so easily adjust it and adapt that anyway. Um, the extra signal button is useful, but, you know, they're not deal breakers. And Rec 2020, I think, are so, at the moment at least with the current firmware, limited applications. It's not something that would sway me to an FS7 II. Okay. So, you know, who, who is going to buy this camera? Who's going to spend the extra? I think if you are buying a camera from scratch, you don't have one, it, has, it, it is tempting, but the price difference is not insignificant. It's, it's a largest mm -hmm. price difference. I think the, the price, the, the extra features, you know, the hand grip changes and everything else, I think if you add up the cost of all of those things, if you had to replace the arm, you had, it would probably get quite close to that. £1,800 price difference. So it's not an unreasonable price difference. But, you know, the, the, I think one of the big things about the FS7, the, the standard FS7, is, is one of the things, it's cheap. It, you get amazing bang for the buck with that yes. camera. And I think that's one of the real reasons why it has become this industry standard. Because for the money, it's in, there's nothing out there that's even close to it. You know, you get one hell of a lot of camera for not a lot of money. FS7 II, let's face it, it's competing against um, C300 Mark II, yeah. uh, sorry, C, C500 even, price-wise. And then it becomes a little bit more of a difficult decision. You know, is it that much better or that much different? Um, we have to wait and see. And I think something that's perhaps worth mentioning, of course, is that we are going to see some camera price rises in the UK. You know, the euro, the, the pound is weaker now. A lot of uh, equipment has come into the UK prior to Brexit, prior to everything else, at the pre-UK, the pre-Brexit 
exchange rate prices. And what I think one, what we're going to see is once those stocks are sold, once those stocks have gone from dealers and from Sony or from everyone else, we're going to see the prices go up because any cameras that come into the UK in the future, because of the exchange rate difference, are going to be more expensive. So we are going to see prices of, I think yeah. the FS7 has just recently gone up actually anyway, hasn't it, by 10%, I believe. So we are going to see price rises across the board and not just with Sony cameras, but with everybody. Once Definitely. Canon have sold their stocks from pre-exit, so prices are going to creep up. Um, if you're looking to buy a camera right now, I would probably suggest that while even though exchange rates don't look great and everything else right now, it's probably better to buy now than hang on, because yeah. I don't think it's a situation that's going to improve anytime soon. Yeah. If anything, I think it's going to get worse. And I think that is something to bear in mind if you're in the market for a camera. Okay. FS7, I, I think in, in some respects, Sony have been considerate to existing camera owners here, because I think if the price difference had been smaller, existing FS7 owners would be really pissed off. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if an FS7 II had come out and it was only a £500 price difference and it had variable ND filter and all these other things, as an FS7 owner myself, I'd have been pissed off. <laughs> um, so, so maybe there's an element of, you know, thankfully the price difference is big enough that there is still room for both models. You know, if, if the price difference was too small, FS7 would struggle to coexist alongside FS7 too. So they've got to have a reasonable gap. Hmm. So, yeah, I, I kind of see why the gap is the size that it is. But I think ultimately it's only you that's going to be able to decide whether it's worth it for you. Hmm. Well, that might be a nice point now to ask. Indeed. Ask the audience, as they used to say. Um, so we have another poll question coming up. And it, again, it's just interesting to, to find out what, what your opinion is mm. and whether you think it is worth, after listening to Alistair's fantastic presentation, whether it is worth the money. And you've got a couple of options, definitely. Not if I've already got FS7. Yes, if I was buying one from scratch. Or mm. no, not at all. And... Um, it's interesting. I'm this, I'm, this, what, what I'm seeing with the numbers so far is kind of what I thought is that, the, that if people were buying from scratch, they'd be much more yep. inclined to go with an FS7 II. Yep. Um, I'm surprised to see, actually, I didn't think it would be as high as it is at 54% mm. we've got at the moment is saying, yes, if I was buying from scratch. Um, 3%, yes, definitely. Yeah, I thought that might be a little <laughs> bit higher than that. I didn't think that was going to be a big number, but I thought it might be more than 3%. Um, I thought perhaps the not if I already had an FS7 would be higher. Um, mm. I'm quite surprised to see that 30% of people with that already have FS7 think that it might be worth spending the money for the variable ND. Yeah. It's a tough one. It is a tough one. It's not. It isn't an easy one. That I yeah. I just so like that variable ND filter. It's such a useful thing to have, yeah. especially if you do a lot of time lapse. Um, doing day to night, night to day, and things like that, and being able to use a combination of variable ND and variable aperture mm. together. You, know, you get a 14-stop range, depending on your lens. You know, variable is incredible and so mm. useful for time-lapse and things like that. So yeah. depends on what you shoot, I guess, as to how useful you're going to find it. Yeah. We've kind of reached the end. So we've, a couple of last-minute questions yeah. have come in. So if the FS7 sensor sees Rec. 709, what's happening when you shoot in S-Log? Well, yeah, it's, this, it's a similar thing. Um, if we close the poll, I can just go back to this slide. <clears throat> That the FS7, when you shoot in S-Log, yes, you're capturing 14 stops of dynamic range. You're capturing a much bigger dynamic range than you would in 709. But in terms of color, you can record using the s gamma 3 Cine or s gamma color space, which is a big color space. But the sensor, in terms of the colors that the sensor is seeing, they're not filling that color space. But what is happening is that the colors are being recorded with the correct values. So that when you go into post and you apply the LUT for that color space or do your grade, it looks correct. So it is still important to have these color gammas, S gamma, S gamma 3, and to use them because you're recording the colors in the right way. And yes, you are recording a bigger range than you would with 709, but it's not nearly as big a range as the F55 can record. The F55 sensor can see a much greater range of colors. Now, in practice, in reality, what does it mean in the real world? Well, I do know that if I put an F55 and an F5, they're, they're even closer cameras together side by side, 
I can see a difference in the colors between the two cameras. The F55 does have a little bit better color. Is it a deal breaker? No, I own an F5. I haven't rushed out to buy an F55, even though I've used an F55 many, many times, and I do like what it does. So it's not a deal breaker. It's, it's not something to get hung up on. It's not something to go, oh my God, my camera can't see all of these colors. I'm wasting my time recording s -Gamut. That's not true. You're not wasting your time. You are recording more color by recording s -Gamut, and you're recording them in the correct space, the correct domain. Um, the audience would have a tough time telling the difference. I think your sort of uneducated or public audience would have a tough time telling between an F55 and an F5 or an F FS7 in many cases. Um, we're, we're only talking small amounts. But obviously, you know, if you are a perfectionist, if you are trying to get the very, very best, if you're making a movie where you've got 100, 200,000 pound budget or big, big production like that, and the cost difference between renting an FS7 or renting an F55 is on your overall budget going to be 1,000 or 1,500 quid, well, you'd hire the F55 because that amount in a 100 or 200,000 pound budget is effectively insignificant. But for corporate video, for web video stuff you're going to do online, I mean, it's worth remembering, you know, anything you do online is being viewed on a computer screen or, or conventional TV, they're all 709. So the audience is only ever seeing in 709 anyway. So at the moment, at least, they're not going to see a great deal of difference regardless of what you shoot it on. Sure. As more and more Rec20 TVs get into the market, which is happening now, and as more and more stuff is delivered via services such as Netflix, where the TV talks to Netflix, Netflix talks back to the TV and the TV says, Netflix says to the TV, what TV are you? And the TV says, I'm a Sony or a Samsung, blah, blah, blah. And Netflix says, oh, you're a 2020 TV. I will send you 2020 color. And in that signal that comes from Netflix to the TV, the TV then switches to 2020, then it'll become more significant. But that's sometimes still, yes, it's happening now. Netflix already does that with their very high-end content, um, but it's still not an everyday thing. So it's, it's not something to panic about, not something to, to really worry about. Um, and really, we've, we've, we've come to our end of our hour. Um, so, um, yeah, so 2020 is, is colour, not gamma. Yeah, yeah. So, so perhaps we should wrap it up then. Thanks very Indeed. much, yes. Alistair, hopefully um, the information that we've imparted as given you some uh, ideas as to whether you are going to stay put, whether you're going to make the leap, or whether you're going to choose something else. I don't know. But um, at least it will, I'm sure it will have been of, of help. As I say thanks again to Alistair. Great presentation, as always. Thanks to you for listening and joining in. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, goodbye for now. <laughs>